Turn your Bibles to the 15th chapter of Matthew. I read about a pastor who had been ministering for about 35 years, and uh, after he passed away, uh, the only thing people remembered about him, they didn't remember any of the sermons that he preached. They remember that a poem he wrote on a whim. You probably will remember the poem. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the night, not a creature was stirring. House, oh, and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. <laughs> That's as far as I'm going. We remember, imagine that, remember, spending all those years, in fact, even writing books and uh, ministering week after week, but he was remembered for a poem that he wrote. The, the question would be, what would you, what will you be remembered for? It's, it's, it's really hard to think because what you think may not be it. Matthew, the 15th chapter of Matthew, he writes about a lady who briefly enters the stage and then disappears forever. She came with a request for Jesus. She had a daughter who was vexed by the devil and she wanted Jesus to heal her daughter. And she became known and is still known as the woman who would not take no for an answer. You could not discourage this lady. Let's take a look at it, Matthew 15th chapter. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region. We're not even told what town she came from, just that region. And cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But Jesus answered her, Not a word. That is highly uncharacteristic of Jesus, who is known as a man of compassion. And yet, it says he didn't answer one word. You would have expected Jesus to say something. A lot of people wear these little bracelets that what would Jesus do? They would never guess this. Who would have ever expected Jesus not to answer a woman who was pleading for her daughter's healing? But it was a test. It was a test. You can't tell at the very beginning, but it was a test. In fact, most of the times, the tests that we're put through, we don't, we don't know at the beginning. It's not until later on we look back that we realize that, that we've just been through a test. Matthew introduces her to us as a woman who came to Jesus because she had a great need. And Jesus doesn't answer her. He said, well, what does that have to do with me? Plenty. Have you ever asked God for anything and got silence? Have you, ever, have you ever come to, into the presence of the Lord and said, Lord, I, I just need some help here. And it's just this area that I'd like you to focus your attention on it because there's a, an emergency brewing right now and I got a crisis. Would you, and nothing. Nothing. The heavens are silent. You came humbly. You came respectfully. But you got nothing. Anybody here ever pray and it seemed like the, the heavens are brass and you didn't get any answer from the Lord? And, and you, you believe because you went to the church and the, and the preacher said that the Lord answers prayer, but, you, but your prayer wasn't answered. You cast all of your cares on him and you got no answer. And you're left handling this silent treatment. Silence. How do you handle a silent treatment? Every one of us is going to be in a situation where we've got to. How do you do it? Typically what happens is this. We, we are handling God's silence and we think, immediately we think, well, it must be because God's angry with me. He, he didn't answer because he's upset. He, he didn't answer because he doesn't care. He didn't answer me because I must have done something wrong. And the devil loves you to think the thought, you must have done something wrong because he'll come right along and explain all the things you did wrong. And it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to figure out, I must have done something wrong for this pay, 
payoff. And since, since God's not answering, it's attached to something that I did wrong. Everybody has done something wrong, so everybody can come to the same conclusion. God's not answering me because I did something wrong. And all the while, it was a test. All the while, we're putting our energy in, there must be something wrong, and we start to connect the dots. Well, that, that day I did this, and then I did that, and, then, and now God's not answering our prayer. So I said, it must be me. Anybody here ever done that? The silent treatment. We don't know how to handle the silent treatment. But it was a test. Now, this story gets worse. I mean, this is just the beginning of the story. But he answered her not a word. Then we read this. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. You could read that text over and over again. I'm going to share with you something that you're not going to find in there. You're not going to find anything in there where she cried after them. She has nothing to say to them. She was just talking to the Lord. But the disciples have a problem with her. They have a problem with her and they're asking Jesus to send her away because she's crying. She's not crying after them. She's crying after the Lord. But I want you to notice something. It's important here. There are times when you, you come to the Lord and you ask the Lord, you want something from the Lord, and you end up running into some of God's kids that may not be the best examples of God's kids. Why were these disciples so ornery and so mean-spirited when it came to this lady? Could be because she was a Canaanite, she was a foreigner, she wasn't a Jew. And so they pull out the race card? I mean, we're talking about the church. We're talking about God's kids. And I got to thinking that whenever you come to Jesus, it's never Jesus and you. Oh, we, we would like to think it's just, just me and you, Jesus, and I'm bringing my request to you, and I need an answer for my prayer. The, the truth of the matter is it's Jesus, you, and God's kids. And some of God's kids, shall we talk about some of God's kids? Some of God's kids don't like you. Is that a surprise? And we're going to have to deal with the fact that some of God's kids may not like you. And you got to deal with the reality that there are God's kids in the mix. And just because you're coming to Jesus doesn't mean you're going to not run into one of God's kids that may not appreciate who. How, here's the question. How badly, here, here it is, how badly do you need what Jesus has? Because if you badly need what Jesus has and you're going to let some harebrained saint keep you from getting to Jesus, then you don't need it bad enough. How badly do you need your job? Do you need it badly enough to put up with some cranky boss? How badly do you need that welfare check? Do you need the welfare check badly enough to put up with a rude social worker? Did you know that 250,000 Americans every week quit their jobs because somebody said and somebody did and they're not putting up with this anymore and out they go because this is a bad season for people to be doing things like that but 250 and that doesn't count the people who think about wanting to quit but 250,000 people every year quit the job because somebody they if, if you want something bad enough you will put up with stuff in order to get it if you want what Jesus has, this is real practical. If you want what Jesus has, sometimes you're going to run into one of his kids that got a mean spirit. One of his kids is dysfunctional. One of his kids don't see it the old way. One of his kids is too pushy. One of his kids is too opinionated. If you want what Jesus has and you're willing to go through what it is that his kids do, you will get what it is. It's a test. It's a test. We need to learn how to put up with the silent treatment, the times when God doesn't answer us like we want him to answer us. We have to learn how to put up with the cold shoulder when people don't act or behave the way we would like God's kids to act or behave. And that's what this woman does. She, she puts up with the silent treatment that Jesus gives. She puts up with the cold shoulder that the disciples are giving her. So, so, sometimes you... So, you know what, it could, be, it could be that the person that you're having trouble with is the person that's actually keeping you from getting what Jesus wants to give you. God anointed David to become the next king of Israel. 
But David had to deal with a scallywag, King Saul. Had to deal with him. And if he wasn't willing to deal with him, he would never become the king. Sometimes we've got to put up with stuff in order to get the promises that God wants to give us. How, the question is, how badly do you want what you say Jesus has to give you? That's the question. And we got to think about it sometimes. Lord, do, do I want this thing bad enough to overlook what that person said? Do I want this thing bad enough to overlook that attitude that that other person? Do I want this thing bad enough? And this woman comes to tell us, yes, she wants it bad enough to overlook a silent treatment. She wants it bad enough to overlook a cold shoulder. Things get worse. But he answered and said to this woman, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to realize that Jesus himself is pulling out the race card. He's saying to this lady, you don't qualify for the blessing that I have. You got the wrong race. You got the wrong face. You're in a wrong location. Something's wrong. You, you, you don't qualify. It, it, you, you're not on the list. It's like Jesus is looking at the list and he says, um, and somebody comes up and says, uh, what's your name? Oh, your name's not on the list. Your, your name's not on the list for healing. Your name is not on the list for deliverance. Your, na your name's not on the list for blessing. That's what he told her. And th that is some pretty tough test to go through. And Jesus says, you're not on the list. And who among us, who, who among us is really on the list to be blessed anyway? If any, does anybody here deserve God's blessing? I mean, do we deserve to have been blessed by the Lord as much as we've been blessed? We don't deserve to be blessed any more than the people in Japan. Uh, and they went through a tsunami and an earthquake and devastation. So, uh, is, is it the reason that we haven't gone through that because we're so wonderful? No. None of us deserve the blessings of God. Here's a woman, she, she refuses to, to, to accept no as an answer. She puts up with a cold shoulder of the disciples, the silent treatment of Jesus, and now some harsh statements. This is a harsh statement, but he answered and said, I was not sent except for the lost sheep, lost sheep of the Jews, of the house of Israel. You're not part of the lost sheep. I'm not, you're not on the list. She's snubbed. She's ignored. She's insulted. She's put down. Most people would walk out the door and slam it on the way out, but this lady, she came and worshipped him. Did I read that right? Did Matthew make a mistake? She came and worshipped him? I mean, after she is abused and she's neglected and she is put down and she's insulted and she's ignored, and she comes and what? She comes and worships him? Here's a lady who is not willing to take no for an answer. She's, she's so driven and she's so focused on what it is that Jesus has got for her. She says, you can call me what you want. Just give me what I need. I don't care what you call me. I came to receive a blessing. Most of us would have thrown in a towel and walked off in a huff. She worships. She worships. She, she, she's speaking to the one who did not say a word to her says blessed be the name of the Lord but he answered and said it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs <laughs> this is a tough passage this is an insult Dogs in those days were associated with the, with the Gentiles. Gentiles were dogs. I, I, I got, there, there's some things in scripture that there's just no way I could say it, but I'm not going to be able to communicate it properly to you unless I demonstrate it. So, so I'm going to demonstrate it. I will now be the Iron Chef <laughs> on, on the Food Channel. Jesus starts talking to her about bread. And he says, it's not good to take the bread that belongs to the children and give it to the dogs. Wow. 
That is, that, it, it, that's why I say when people wear these braces, say, what would Jesus do? <laughs> We'd never think Jesus would do a thing like that. This lady is put under an incredible test. I wonder if the test that she's being put under is a test that we might be put under. That God might come along sometime and be silent to a request that you have. And one of God's kids might come along and give you the cold shoulder. But you are so determined and so focused, you are going to persevere. You're going to get what it is that God promises to give you, even if you're last in line. So here's this lady. She, she is told, she's given this insult. And, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to demonstrate the making of bread. I'm going to bring some elements out here. To make bread, you need salt. Not all that, but you need salt. <laughs> to make bread, you need vegetable oil. Got to have that. To make bread, you need flour. I got some flour put in there. To make bread, you need yeast. To make bread, you need a little sugar. A little sugar. And, and you need a couple of eggs. Oh, would you catch this? <laughs> you need some eggs. I was smart enough to make them hard work. <laughs> you make the eggs. You get all this stuff here, and you mix it all up together. You got to mix it up. This is the point. I've said all of that to say this. And she said, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She, what a remarkable statement. She is insulted, called a dog, and she turns the whole thing, in, in fact, if you go back to this story, read the story, it's really not about what Jesus says, it's really about what this lady is saying. She is incredible. She's the only lady in the Bible that surprises God. <laughs> Shocked God, because Jesus later says, wow, I haven't seen faith in all of Israel, just like you. And so she said, let me read it again. She said, yes, Lord, yes, 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 you're right, you're right. The, the bread does belong to the children. But the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now, I want to say something. Well, first, you know, this is the bread. We go through the process of the bread, then you got to mix it. And mix it in real good. Everything is all mixed up. Finally, you got the bread. Here's what I want to say. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, when the iron chef says something, it's said, you know. <laughs> It says, he made, he made the bread. The woman, the woman says, but the dogs, they wait under the master's table waiting for the crumbs. I want to draw an ex a, a comparison between the children that have the loaf and the little dogs that are underneath the table looking for the crumb. There's a big difference between the two. hear all that noise here's the loaf when you give children bread tell me whether or not this is true they'll put jam on it lick off the jam throw the bread out <laughs> I would also say this that when you give children bread oftentimes what they do is they eat all of the center <laughs> and they throw the rest out But if you give a dog a crumb, has there ever, ever been a dog that refused a crumb? We got God's kids who have the loaf, all of it, and waste it. And we got dogs that are just waiting for any crumb that will come their way and they'll eat it. But the point that I want to make this morning is this. When you mix all of these elements, I'll go over it again. You got the vegetable oil, you got the salt, you got the eggs, you got the flour, you got the yeast, you got the sugar. You mix it all together. Mix it all. I didn't bring the water. You got to mix it all, all up together. You mix it until it 
the, the, all of the ingre ingredients have permeated all of the, the dough, then you put it in the oven and out comes this bread. And if, let me, let me just take a little piece of this bread here. This is a little crumb here. That's a crumb. Here's the point. If there is oil in the loaf, there is oil in the crumb. If there's flour in the loaf, there's flour in the crumb. If there's yeast in the loaf, there's yeast in the crumb. Whatever you put in the loaf is in the crumb. And this lady says, I'm willing to be last in line. I'm willing to get under the table. And I'm willing to wait for one crumb. Because I know that if there's a miracle in the loaf, there'll be a miracle in the crumb. I know that if there is power in the loaf, there'll be power in that crumb. I know that if there's wisdom in the loaf, there'll be wisdom in the crumb. If there's healing in the loaf, there'll be healing in the crumb. If there's deliverance in the loaf, there'll be deliverance in the crumb. If there's forgiveness in the loaf, there's forgiveness in the crumb. Maybe sometimes what we need to do is just stand before God and say, Lord, I'm willing to be last in line and get under the table and wait for a crumb. This is the crumb. All, all, all I need is, all I need is, you know, all, all the woman who had the issue of blood needed was one little touch. All the dying thief needed was just one little crumb. He said, Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And Jesus gave him the crumb. Last thing on his way out, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in, in paradise. All, all the prodigal son needed was just a little crumb. He said, if my father could only hire me, just as hire me, hire me just as one of the hired hands. It's just a crumb. All I want is a crumb. And his father welcomed him with open arms because all you need is a crumb. Don't overlook the crumbs because what's ever in the loaf is in the crumb. Same power, same Lord, same strength, same forgiveness, same mercy, same grace. It's all in the crumb. When I was a kid, I, I, I grew up on the crumb of poverty. <laughs> I was crummy. <laughs> and uh, when finally I, I got a job, it was a crummy job. Uh, and I got a crummy paycheck. <laughs> and I got a crummy paycheck for a long time. But I'm going to tell you something. That crummy job and that crummy paycheck took me from there to here. We can survive under crumbs if we allow the crumbs to do what crumbs will do. Maybe you, maybe you, maybe you have a crummy situation right now that you're dealing with. Maybe, the, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a crummy set of circumstances. Maybe you wish it had been different, but it's not, and you got a crummy opportunity. Not much. It's crummy. If you're willing to do what this lady does, you'll be first in line. She worshiped him. I don't care what you call me, I'm going to worship you. It's like Job. Though God slay me, yet will I trust him. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't care what you call me. I don't care what you say. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't care what happens. I don't care what comes. I don't care what goes. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to bless the Lord. Some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. That's wonderful. I was born with plastic. You know, that's just the way it was. But I'm here to tell you that God can take a crummy situation and turn it into an ideal situation if you just worship him. It's an attitude of worship. It's not always corporate worship. It's not always worship in a, in a church setting with the music and the organ and the playing. And the, it's just 
thank you, Lord. It's another day. I want to thank you because when I breathed this morning, I realized I was alive. I'm going to seize the day. I want to thank you for those you've put into my life and those that are around me. I want to thank you. Lord, sometimes I feel like I'm last in line, and I feel like, even though you didn't say it, I feel like what I heard heaven say is, you came to bless the others, and you didn't really come to bless me, and my name's not even on the list, but I don't care whether my name is on the list or not. I've come to worship you. I've come to praise you. I've come to lift up your name. I've come to thank you. I'm not thanking you because my name's on the list. I'm thanking because you're on the list. I want to thank you because you're the Lord. You're the King. You're the Redeemer. You're my Savior. You're the bread of life. You're the living water. You are the rose of Sharon. You are everything that I'm ever going to need. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with Jesus. I'm going to keep on praising you because you're worthy of praise. It doesn't matter what people are saying. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. I just know that I'm going to be praising the Lord. I've come. I've just come to worship you, Lord. I want you to sing.